Saraha's Treasury of Songs. Or maybe we should say Saraha's Treasury of Diss Tracks. <laughs> the Brahmins who do not know the truth vainly recite the Vedas for With earth and water and kusha grass, they make preparations. And seated at home, they kindle fire. And from the senseless offerings that they make, they burn their eyes with the pungent smoke. And lordly garb with one staff or three, they link themselves, they think themselves wise with their brahmanical lure. Vainly is the world enslaved by their vanity. They do not know that Dharma is the same as non Dharma. By the way, th this is one of the reasons why I kind of left the identity of being a monk with the shaved head and the very beautiful robes found that it affected my communication and my sense of just naturalness in the world conversations i was having and impressions i was making it also seems to carry some kind of authority even if it's only in your ego uh, nothing against those who want to renounce uh, renunciate, but wouldn't it be even more of an, a radical renunciation if you didn't even look like a Dharma practitioner, yet you slept on the floor, yet you only ate one meal a day, you were celibate, you never lied, you never steal, and you don't even shave your head. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why you may notice that our site, YouTube, this group, everything's kind of simple. It's not very shiny. And it's because I've been around Buddhism for quite some time. And we all have been exposed to spirituality to a pretty significant degree. And I feel maybe that we can approach it more bare bones where it's not about the external stuff so with ashes these masters smear their bodies and on their heads they wear matted hair seated within the house they kindle lamps seated in a corner they tinkle bells man he just rips into them doesn't he <laughs> even talking about their dreads. They adopt a posture and fix their eyes, whispering in ears and deceiving folk, teaching widows and bald-headed nuns and such like, imitating them as they take their feed. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, maybe we can go back to that a little bit. I just mentioned my experience as a nun. I mean, as a monk, which maybe is not much different, right? Nuns and monks. But here also, although we do do short meditations in the beginning, if you notice, uh, I just keep my eyes open. And if I look at something, it's okay. Uh, if I move a little bit, it's all right. It's kind of just, we're able to sit here and be okay with it rather than take up a fixed posture which is a little bit counter towards that naturalness that natural relaxation that we might find that's why if you can just feel like i'm completely done i've arrived no more stages nothing uh, that kind of relief of tension that you get there is very important it, it shows you what it's like when your body your mind feels natural, feels relaxed. So it's also talking about looking like the monastics. And I must say that happens so often that monasticism is taken as an authority all the way into governments and things like that. So those of you who do dress like people and nobody really knows that you practice Dzogchen, 
Well, good on you, really. I feel like that only empowers you. It makes you more authentic. Again, if there are monastics practicing Dzogchen, I'm not saying those robes, uh, anything wrong. I, I think the, they're beautiful. But, you know, I'm also saying that there's something to be said about the lay people who completely blend in and also share their wisdom from a kind of equilibrium or from an egalitarian kind of standpoint. Okay, the Jain monks mocked the way with their appearance, with their long nails and their filthy clothes, or else naked and with this uh, disheveled hair. I don't think I know that word, sorry. Disheveled. Enslaving themselves with their doctrine of release. So he's even going in on the chains here. If by nakedness one is released, then dogs and jackals must be so. If from absence of hair there comes perfection, then the bottom of the maidens must be so. It really, I remember this line actually from a long time ago. It's the butt, they say the butt of the girls. So it says if, if from absence of hair comes perfection, then the butt of the girls must be so too. Here it says the hips, so somebody must have cleaned up a little bit. <laughs> if from having a tail there comes release, then for the peacock and yak it must be so. If wisdom consists of eating just what one finds. Uh, could you roll, scroll up? Then for the elephant and horse, it must be so. For these Jain monks, there is no release, Saraha says. Deprived of the truth of happiness, they do but afflict their own bodies. Then there are the novices and bhikshus with the teachings of the old school, who renounce the world to be monks. Some are seen sitting and reading the scriptures, some wither away on their concentration on thought. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I I'm personally am not bold enough to diss on the bhikshus and bhikshunis. Uh, bhikshu unis. Yeah. Uh, but Saraha is, is quite bold here. So yeah, we can move on. I'm not going to say a word about that others have recourse to the great vehicle here are two references when it says the way it's talking about the middle way and yamaka and here again the great vehicle is mahayana okay so others have recourse to the great vehicle so even he's, he's kind of going in on mahayana this is the doctrine which expounds the original text they say Others just meditate on mandala circles. Others strive to define the fourth stage of bliss. With such investigating, they fall from the way. Some would in investige it as space. Others endow it with the nature of voidness, and thus they are generally in disagreement. Whoever deprived of the innate seeks nirvana can in no wise acquire the absolute truth. Whoever is intent on anything else, how may they gain release? Will one gain release abiding in meditation? What's the use of lamps? What's the use of offerings? What's to be done by reliance on mantras? What is the use of austerities? What is the use of going on pilgrimage? Is release achieved by bathing in water? Abandon such false statements and renounce such illusion. Then knowledge of this, there is nothing else. Other than this, no one can know. It is this that's read and this that's meditated. It's this that's discussed in treatises and old legends. This is no school of thought that does not have 
a thought, right? Even though it says though. There's no school of thought that does not have this as its aim, but one sees it only at the feet of one's master. If the words of one's master that enter the heart, it seems like a treasure in the palm of one's hand. The world is enslaved by falsehood, says Raha, and the fool does not perceive his true nature. Without meditating, without renouncing the world, one may stay at home in the company of one's wife. Can that be called perfect knowledge, Saraha says? If one is not released while enjoying the pleasure of sense? So that's an important point and why I tell you all, I don't tell you to go kind of uh, indulge in sense pleasures, but you're already, you know, most of us, we indulge in sense pleasures to some degree, whether it's drinking coffee or uh, sexual related stuff, whatever it may be. So that's why I don't tell you to stop. You know, if you ask me for advice, I will say, well, well, keep on, just let it be, you know, and within those sense pleasures, you will experience self liberation. There's uh, wisdom in that profound awakening in that. Okay. And I know it's a little contrary to Kind of an orthodox approach or things we may be used to but it's very powerful way very uh freeing you know from, from the actual sense desires so if it's already manifest what's the use of meditation and if it's hidden one is just measuring darkness saraha cries the nature of the innate is neither existent nor non-existent by means of that same essence by which one is born and lives and dies. By means of that one gains the highest bliss. But although Saraha speaks of these profound and mysterious words, this stupid world seems not to understand. <laughs> Everybody not. <laughs> the whole world. <laughs> if it exists apart from meditation, how may one meditate upon it? If it is ineffable, how may it be discussed? The whole world is enslaved by the appearance of things, and no one apprehends their true nature. Mantras and tantras, meditation and concentration, they are all a cause of self-deception. Do not defile in contemplation thought that is pure in its own nature, but abide in the bliss of yourself and cease those torments. Eat and drink, indulge the senses, Fill the mandala with offerings again and again. By things like these, you'll gain the world beyond. Tread upon the head of the foolish worldly and proceed. By the way, here, uh, your sense, like if you, if you end up getting some pleasure from your senses, like getting drunk, getting high, uh, having an orgasm, well, you can dedicate that. It's an offering. It's the beauty of life. You see, so you, you really start to switch, you, you 180 this thing. And, you know, as we go, I'll allow you to kind of uh, just explore that on your own. I don't want to uh, put too much out there, you know, but yeah, you start to sort of see all of this as kind of offerings in the sense of appearances of the mind. So, where vital breath and mind no longer roam about, where sun and moon do not appear, there, O oh man, put thy thought to rest. This is the precept taught by Saraha. Do not discriminate, but see things as one, making no distinction of families. Let the whole of the threefold world become one state of great passion. Here there is no beginning, no middle, no end, neither samsara nor nirvana. In this state of highest bliss, there is neither self nor other. Whatever you see, that is it. In front, behind, in all ten directions, even today, let your master make an end of delusion. There is no need to ask of anyone else. Go ahead, you could scroll up a little while. 
because uh, I have some stuff on the bottom of my screen here. That's why. I... The faculties of sense subside, and the notion of self is destroyed. Oh, friend, such is the body innate. Ask for it clearly of your master. Where thought is held and breath passes hence, that is the highest bliss. Elsewhere, no one go. But elsewhere, one goes nowhere. Now it is a matter of self-experience, so do not err with regard to it. To call it existence or non-existence or even stage of bliss would impose a limitation. How by meditation should one fondly gain release? And why accept such falsehood? Have confidence in the word of your good master. This is the advice that I, Saraha, give. The nature of the sky is originally clear, but by gazing and gazing, the sight becomes obscured. Then, when the sky appears deformed in this way, the fool does not know that the fault's in his own mind. Uh, so you can just leave it in chunks, remember, because the, yeah, the scrolling is a little bit tricky from this distance, I think. Sorry to be so picky about, uh, yeah, but we'll just scroll in paragraphs, okay? So, through fault of pride, he does not see the truth, and therefore, like a demon, he maligns all his way. The whole world is confused by schools of thought, and no one perceives their true nature. They do not perceive the true basis of mind, for upon the innate they impose a threefold falsification. I think they're talking about the three spheres of conception right there. Uh, that kind of trichotomy of subject, action, and object. So, where thought arises and where it dissolves, there you should abide, O oh my son. For, wo for one who thus ponders the truth without it, its true basis, a master's instruction would make everything clear. Saraha so says, O oh fool, surely know the diversity of existence is but a form of thought. One own true nature cannot be explained by another, but is revealed by one's master's instruction. There exists in it not an atom of evil. Both dharma and non-dharma are cleansed and consumed. When one's mind is cleansed, then one's master's good qualities may enter the heart. It is in knowledge of this that Saraha sings, paying no regard to tantra or mantra. <laughs> wow. Men are bound by karma, and by release from karma, the mind is released. And by this release of the mind, they gain for a certainty this highest nirvana. So, like I always say, our karma is kind of like a ball that's been rolled down a hill, and it has momentum. So even if you were to recognize the nature of mind, uh, you will still have some proverbial sort of boulders rolling down the hill. Uh, so you're not, I mean, unless you're very lucky and, and exceptional in some way, but usually uh, the, the great masters all say to sustain that recognition. So it's almost like you recognize the sky now, the sky-like basis and nature of your mind. Well, now the boulders rolling down the hill can just lose their momentum because you're no longer participating. So the more you familiarize with the sky, even though it may not be apparent in the beginning, uh, but as we sit here right now, there's a sky-like mind here. And all our thoughts, everything, the four foundations of mindfulness, thoughts, emotions, body, and environment is all one within that kind of clear light cognizance. So the more we familiarize with that space-like nature of our mind, well, the less we're involved in creating karmic momentum. And so eventually our, our cycles, our repetitive thoughts, all that start to cease. And what's left over is pure presence.
pure perfection. Because we actually intrude on this pure presence with our repetitive thinking and our habitual kind of contriving and reification. So mind is the universal seed. Both samsara and nirvana spring forth from it. Okay, so you may notice here nirvana was used in two different contexts. I'm usually not in favor of the uh, former context there where it says we achieve the highest nirvana, where it's synonymous with enlightenment. Um, I'd rather just use enlightenment because nirvana to me means exhausting. Something's exhausting itself, something's liberating. But once you're enlightened, there's nothing there to be liberated in. So nirvana is really a stage that uh, kind of, you enter a stream of nirvana a stream of self-liberation that's the ball the boulder is losing momentum that's nirvana the karma is exhausting it's burning out it's extinguishing that's nirvana but once that momentum has been extinguished there's probably not nirvana there's only pure enlightenment that's why all the texts always say it's beyond samsara and nirvana <clears throat> Pay honor to to this, that like a wish-granting gem gives all desirable things. Thought bound brings bondage, and release brings release. Of that there is no doubt. By that with which fools are bound, the wise are quickly released. Yeah, so that's an important line, that very thing which binds as Saraha, I don't really call people fools, um, but Saraha is going to say they're fools. Uh, but let's just say that which sentient beings are bound is the same thing that a practitioner uses for their release. So again, desires, our own ignorance, um, all these things become the very basis for our release. So when so bound, it dashes in all directions, but released, it stays calm. Just consider the camel, my friend. I see there a similar paradox. Don't concentrate on yourself, restricting your breath. Uh, fi yogin, don't squint at the end of your nose. O oh, fool, hold fast to the innate uh, and abandon the clinging bonds of existence. <clears throat> 